Привет, in the Bogorne. I'm Russian, and I'll tell my tales from the Russian point of view, because we also want to be heard. And now it's time to finish off with the nerves, beauty and the beast. But before they begin, I need to issue warnings for words that YouTube doesn't even allow me to pronounce. So... And you think I was kidding when I said that my brain needed rest? <laughs> nah, this book is really that bad. Proceed with caution. Now, Beast has a very standard beginning, with one of his parents, namely father, dying even before he was born, and it was up to his mother to rule the kingdom. Unfortunately for her, the neighbouring king believed that stealing candy from a baby is not a proverb, but a call for action, and so he decided to wage war on the baby prince. Though he's probably a king, actually, since his father is dead. What does everyone keep calling him prince? <laughs> well, it's not that this book has ever been logical, so why bother, I guess? Well, anyway, the decision was pretty bad, since the queen turned out to be a badass warrior. Unfortunately, Warfield is not the best playing ground, so she had to abandon her son. Moreover, another fairy decided that she is going to raise the baby by herself. As you can guess, it was a bad fairy and the queen wasn't exactly thrilled as well. In fact, she was actually scared of the fairy, but at that point she didn't exactly have a choice. And, as if living with a scary, all-powerful creature is not hard enough, one day she left, and upon return, decided that from now on, she is only going to use homegrown stuff. And that also included her love life as well. And that's exactly what I was missing in the Beauty and the Beast story, an ugly hag molesting the beast. I don't even want to know how long he had to live in this atmosphere. I had enough seeing him beg to go to his mother, and it's especially uncomfortable knowing that the beast saw the fairy as his mother and wanted to please her. Seriously, I don't want to put two and two together, it's way too much. Finally, the boy talks the creepster into visiting his mother, but she insists that they go together. And when the prince finally meets the queen, it's supposed to be this very tender and loving moment, but the thing is, at that moment, the beast is given a crown on his head and a sword in his hand, and then promptly kicked into the battle. And even though he talks about it as a very exciting experience, I can't stop thinking that it's very concerning that he jumped from a physically abused household to a mentally taxing one. Because, you see, not only did he have to get in charge of an army, he also had to witness countless murders as well as participate in some. I mean, come on, it's war! On a side note, you want to hear something life-changing? Most people place the story of Beauty and the Beast in the 18th century, but here's the thing. The last French monarch that was actually present on the battlefield was Louis XIV in 1697, which is a 17th century. Moreover, he wasn't actually fighting, but simply giving commands from the nearby observation point. But in our case, not only do the Queen and later Beast lead the army, they actually fought their enemies, a practice that was mostly abandoned by 15th century. Which means that the story takes place in the Middle Ages, or at the very least, early French Renaissance period. To be fair, I wouldn't put my money on it, but I feel like this version has the right to exist as well. Anyway, back to our poor beast. He gets slightly injured, and the queen immediately decides to make a deal with the enemy. But when everyone was celebrating the final peace, the fairy decided to announce that she wants to marry a prince. And it's at this moment when the queen decides that it's a very smart idea to offend literally one of the most powerful beings on earth. More so, the book dares to say that the fairy's problem is that she was not just ugly on the outside, she was ugly on the inside. And don't get me wrong, she can burn in hell for all I care, but so does the queen. 
She is the most vain person in the world, thinking that a practically immortal creature who can do magic is below her simply because she does not belong to a royal family. Why does the book make me hate every character in here? So the queen doesn't want her son to become an immortal Emmanuel Macron, so she tells the fairy what she really thinks about her ugly face. And the fairy decides, for some reason, to punish the bees for that. But why? In most iterations, the precursor beast is a major ass, and he is punished for being a major ass. But not this guy. He was even trying to resolve the situation as nicely as possible. You can't punish someone for their mother being a crappy politician. What the hell happened to the idea that the kids are not responsible for their parents' mistakes? Oh, and by the way, did I tell you that the transformation into the beast was extremely painful? No. Well, it was. It was actually so painful that the prince wanted to cancel his life. Fortunately, his mother wanted to follow him. Unfortunately, she didn't. Because at that moment they met a supposedly good fairy. And she promised that there is a way out, she just doesn't know it yet. Supposedly. You see, when the overly <sighs> affectionate fairy cursed the beast, she added a condition that the curse will be broken if a young and beautiful maiden would propose to him. Notice that there is no mention of love here. Also, she must actively search for him while being absolutely sure he is about to eat her up. And I'm not talking about their honeymoon. Also, also, to make Beast's life even harder, she made him stupid. And you know what? This might actually explain the charger's temper tantrum. Anyway, the good fairy promises that she'll find that girl, like she doesn't know who that is. Meanwhile, the royal family needs to keep the prince to base transformation a secret. And do you know what? Remember how a lot of people criticised Disney's Beauty and the Beast remake? Because in it, the servants ended up being cursed with a beast, and were essentially stuck in a magic limbo while the rest of the country continued to live their normal lives, completely forgetting their loved ones. Well, this is pretty much what happens here. You see, there were two maids present during the fight with a witchy fairy, and the queen presumes that they have already told everyone about their future king becoming a literal monster. So the other, presumably good fairy, just nonchalantly turns everyone in the palace into a statue. But don't you worry, when they woke up, they will be as young as they used to be, because God knows this will not affect them in any other way, shape or form. And at the same time, it seems that at least some people were left alive in the kingdom. So Disney's version is actually more accurate than some people give it credit. It's really sad, but accurate nonetheless. So the beast, who was probably still a teenager at the time, was left completely alone in the castle dealing with all the trauma he had gone through these past years. Also, considering Beast's magical transformation, I wouldn't be surprised if he had a crazy moment of trying to figure out whether the magical animals that were beauty servants were cursed humans or actual animals. I am surprised he managed to keep a semblance of sense after this entire experience. And once in a while, he'd be visited by a good fairy, which is portrayed as something good, but honestly, I don't believe that. Considering what we already know about magic users in this universe, I'm pretty sure that they are not the easiest guests to deal with. Throw them a tea that's slightly too cold, and they will curse ten generations of your family. I'm not kidding. Once the beast almost told Beauty who he really is, and the supposedly good fairy threatened to kill her. And remember, she's her niece. I don't even want to imagine what happens to the people she doesn't care about. Finally... One day the fairy comes, bearing happy news. She has finally found 
the right person to break the curse. This person happens to be Beauty. And the fairy concocts a plan on how to bring her to the beast. And this is the part that I enjoy the most about the book. You see, the beast didn't really care about the rose. In fact, his garden is magical and it takes him a day to grow literally anything he wants. So this flower bad literally no significance to him. The reason why he acted so aggressively is because the fairy knew that Beauty asked for a rose and that her father is looking for it. And since the curse specified that the future Mrs. Beast had to come fearing for her life, they decided to act out a scene of Beast threatening the merchant. Genius! Though, seriously, most later versions of the Beauty and the Beast are based on a much shorter Beaumont's version of the story, and as such, the logic of the scene is lost in them. So this story explains so much. I mean, I always thought that the Beast is overreacting with his love for the Rose, but now I get it. One of the biggest mysteries of my childhood is solved. That doesn't happen often. And then the beast tells us his point of view of the events. He fell in love and all that jazz. Nothing really special. But then the beauty left and, um, let's say that he went to a side which didn't have a sea in it. Fortunately, the fairy stopped him. Seriously, this man doesn't need a wife, he needs a therapy. I'd also sign him up for a few hugs, but I'm afraid it'll bring childhood trauma. But that's not it. Our prince here thought that three is a charm and attempted to step off the earth. Again. The fairy actually was using magic to keep him in this reality, so he just stopped eating altogether. Well, ain't his future subjects just the luckiest one? Also, if you remember, in the main story, the beast was revived with water and medicine, but he should have been by food. <sighs> continuity? What's continuity? Anyway... You know the rest, Beauty allowed him to sleep with her, which somehow meant that she proposed to him. Somehow. Honestly, while I still think that Beast was extremely toxic and I really want you to remember that this kind of behaviour is inexcusable, I still maintain that I sympathise with the guy. The prince did nothing wrong to warrant his curse. He didn't commit crimes, he wasn't disrespectful towards anyone, he didn't even act up. All he wanted was to marry a girl that's not a billion years older than him and to get to his mother. It's not his fault that she sucked at diplomacy. So I get why he was scared of losing beauty, because in his eyes she was the healthiest relationship he had. What else was there? All the love he experienced so far was connected with pain. He loved a bad fairy as his mother and she got handy with him. He loved his mother and her actions put him in very dangerous situations. He wanted to love someone his age and was cursed for that. No wonder that he thought that the girl that's doing a bare minimum of not hurting him is the one. But the truth is, she's not. She literally says out loud in front of everyone that she simply pitied the beast and she didn't really have any other feelings for him. I really don't understand why everyone just ignored that and continued to praise her like it's really hard to fall in love with a handsome rich prince. Anyway, so the beast ended his story and right at that point arrived someone who honestly has no business being in this story. Beauty's real father. The fairy introduces the father to the daughter, and for someone who was about to spend her entire love with an old merchant, she's very quick to call the king before her a father. 
Her psyche is more flexible than an Olympic gymnast, I see. But now I'm not the girl, just imagine what the guy must be thinking. His sister-in-law kept the fact that his daughter is love of him for over a decade. At this point, I personally wouldn't care that she's a powerful fairy and I'd still try to arrange her meeting with the fairy Jesus, but he's too nice. He doesn't attempt to murder anyone, and that automatically makes him my favourite character. Please let him stay a decent human being. Please. Because next we get his backstory. So as you remember, the king and the witchy queen come from a land appropriately titled Happy Island, where anyone can marry irregardless of their partner's status, including the king himself. That's why their ruler was allowed to marry a simple shepherdess, but not before asking her to become his lover. No, no, he didn't push it, so he's still my favourite character. And then the fairy proceeded to dump a whole can of salt on the king's wound by reminding that his beloved wife died when he was away and couldn't even say his last goodbye. Oh wait, she actually didn't die. The thing is, she was a fairy, which okay, we already know. But the thing we didn't think about is that she's many times older than the king. Is there a single normal relationship in this book? But regardless, they get married, which apparently is illegal according to the fairy laws. And surprisingly, it's not illegal to marry humans specifically, but anyone who's less powerful than you are. At least until you reach a certain age. Before that, fairies are considered to be sort of underaged, and their elders make all the decisions. When you become an elder yourself, however, you will be allowed to marry whoever you want. But at this point, fairies become so old and ugly that their only punishment is that their husbands will despise them. But Beauty's mom mistook her for a protagonist and assumed she can keep her marriage a secret and as such avoid a punishment. And she did. For a while. You see, fairies have to help people around the world, but she concentrated on the people on the Happy Island, which I get. We all tend to prefer people who we know and care about over complete strangers. But it also feels that some innocent people were robbed of their happy endings simply because some fairy couldn't keep it in her lady pants. So the fairy council found out about the injustice and told her off. And she promised not to do that again. But she did it again. And here's the thing. The book mentioned that Beauty's mother couldn't leave her kingdom for more than 15 minutes. But why? It's an island. With the biggest problem of the past, not being able to marry outside your social status, is already solved. I can't imagine there being so much crime that a fairy couldn't leave for a couple of hours. I don't know. It just feels that the fairy simply didn't want to go somewhere and not that she couldn't. But as I said, the fairy mother of beauty is caught. And it is actually the horrible excuse of a fairy that raised the prince who doomed her. And the punishment was to spend eternity in the fairy prison, knowing that her husband will forever mourn the death of his very much alive wife. And that her daughter will marry a monster. Yeah, I don't like the story, but I do enjoy how things are very much interconnected. Also, I just love how the fairy queen, mother of beauty, you get the point, servants didn't find her in the morning and thought that people will accuse them of doing something to her, so they decided to convince the king that his wife is dead. Huh, why bother looking for her? She's most probably dead already. And the king and the princess ended up being the only people in the entire kingdom who didn't know that the queen might still be alive. What assholes! Anyway, while the king was needlessly grieving, the bad fairy was spying on him. Add unsolicited voyeurism into the list of her offences. But I digress. She got really intrigued by him because the fairy queen described him as the best man in the entire world. 
literally. And of course the evil fairy falls in love. This is a teensy bit less creepy because the dad is actually adult. Hopefully. Back in the day some kids could be very young, you know. But regardless, they still had a huge age difference and she also looks like an old person. So there is that. So the fairy makes up a plan of kidnapping another woman and taking her appearance. What? The entire story exists because the evil fairy was too old and ugly to marry the prince. And you are telling me that all this time she could take a form of some pretty girl, seduce a prince and live happily ever after with him? I just love how Villeneuve described the kidnapping of that poor woman as her being deposited in a safe place as if she's a stack of money being put into a bank. Anyway, so the evil fairy comes to the king's court looking like another woman, who by the way is another queen running from someone who killed her husband and usurped her kingdom. So she tells Beauty's father of this story and he offered her to stay in the court. The king even asked her to take care of the beauty, since the fairy claimed that she had a daughter who died in the whole ordeal. Little did he know that all the fake queen wanted was to get into his bed. And I didn't need that mental image in my head. I'll need therapy after that. So the fairy manipulates some members of nobility into trying to convince the king to marry for the second time. But he immediately sees through it and does something very unexpected for a fairy tale states that he's not going to give his daughter a stepmother. I don't know, it feels like so many stories rely on that plot point that it feels refreshing to see a man being loyal to his dead wife. Moreover, he states that he doesn't want to affect his daughter's chances of getting a crown. That's a very nice fatherly moment. I'm telling you, he is my favourite character in this book. So, the fairy gets an idea that the only thing that stands between her and the king is the beauty and she decides to kill her. For that, she at first makes it look like she absolutely adores the girl, and everyone fall for it. Then she and another, hmm, noble couple bring her to the forest for a nice little walk where they wanted to assassinate the baby. Also, their idea of an alibi was to look really, really sad. Fortunately for the beauty, her aunt was watching over her and she saved her by attacking her enemies in the form of a bear. She then stripped the girl naked and scattered her blood-covered clothes around the forest. That's a thing that happened. The eel fairy thought that the girl and the other two were killed during an animal attack and did not really bother to investigate. But the fairy good auntie now had to hide her knee somewhere. And, get that, she decides to put her in the family of literal millionaires. That's like trying to hire a baby by giving it to Kardashians or something. What can possibly go wrong? Okay, to be fair, the house where she wanted to place the baby was a small provincial one. But she then learns that it's only a nursing home, or something like that, and the baby's actually a daughter of a wealthy merchant. I mean, she's a fairy, she could have snapped her fingers and make the three ladies in the house forget that something ever happened. But nope. She thought that a daughter of a wealthy merchant is not going to attract any attention whatsoever. Also, I can't help but think that Villeneuve never seen a child in her life. You see, it was told that Beauty was three at the time when their aunt had to place her in another home, while the child in the nursery was described as a baby in the cradle. Of course, English is not my first language, but if someone described me a baby like that, I'm going to think of a newborn where the three-year-old is capable of walking, talking, it's practically a mini-human. But okay, let's say I misunderstood something, or it's the translation's fault. But a three-year-old is still not an alien potato head that looks like any other newborn. They have actual features that's unique to them. 
and it's not as easy to confuse three-year-olds as it is to confuse newborns. And yes, the fairy could have charmed the nurses and little beauty. But she didn't do anything to her adoptive father, and yet he was absolutely sure that she was, uh, the fruit of his law. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm not thinking about his... any part of his body. No, no, no. What I mean to say is that either the merchant is not as good of a father as he is portrayed, because not recognizing your own daughter is a pretty straightforward sign of neglect. Or, quite as likely, Villeneuve couldn't keep her story straight to save her life. By the way, for the timeline. This all happened when the evil fairy was away for some time when raising the prince. Which begs the question, how much time did the prince have to spend alone? And how much is he older than the beauty? Villeneuve didn't mention any ages, of course, but I thought he was a grown child at least. And I tend to know what's better, a let's say five-year-old beast being abandoned by his caretaker or a sixteen-year-old beauty marrying someone who could be closer to thirty. This book is already too uncomfortable to read. Don't make it any harder. Moving on. The good fairy used a magical book to spy on the evil fairy and she caught her in the moment of cursing the beast. And the condition of this curse fit really well with the beauty's curse of having to marry a monster. Moreover, the fact that the evil fairy wanted to marry a young prince somehow warranted the punishment of that of Beauty's mother, even though it was said that old and powerful witches can marry humans. I don't know, we already established that Villeneuve has a very selective memory regarding her story. Anyway, the fairy aunt was finishing her tale by saying that she can't bring Beauty's mother to them, even though she's definitely alive. When suddenly they all heard the most wonderful melody that apparently could put Amsterdam out of business. It was, well, we all guessed it, the Fairy Queen. You see, in the fairy world there is something called the ordeal of the serpent, when fairies turn into a snake and undergo certain obstacles. The book doesn't really give more details. And apparently it is extremely dangerous, so much so that many fairies are afraid to do that because they fear they might actually die in the process. But for some reason the daughter of a queen fairy, like an actual fairy who's the queen of all fairies, had to undergo this serpent ordeal. I don't know why, don't ask me. <laughs> And so Beauty's mother volunteered to do that instead. She thought that in this way she'll either die and thus will be free of her suffering, or will become actually free if she succeeds. Now, of course she succeeded, and then she decided to do that one more time for her own sake. And it's mentioned in like two sentences, but that is actually a very interesting thing to read about, so... Why don't they see that instead of beauty watching yet another theatre play? Anyway, suddenly 16 people arrive to the castle. These are beauty's adoptive family and no husbands of her sisters, who, you know, decided that since they can't marry beauty, might as well settle for the next best thing. And the book makes its final effort to hate on the sisters. But, honestly, I pity them so much. I mean, sure, they weren't the nicest people, but we didn't really get a chance to explore their characters. All we know is that they are all stuck in a loveless, possibly toxic marriages for the rest of their lives. I don't think they were bad enough to deserve that. Also, there is this little moment when Beauty asks her family to call her by her name. And this is framed as a very humble act on her part. But remember, she's not talking about her actual name. She means her nickname, Beauty. So it's like, oh, don't call me your highness. Call me simply Beauty. I 
I don't know, it just doesn't have the same effect on me as it should. But regardless, Beauty and the Beast get married. The fairy gives them as a present a magical chariot with horses that had gold antlers. Don't ask. And the horses can apparently run faster than any airplane, so they could visit any place in the world whenever they wanted. Beauty's real father also became young again, and he could now be compared to his son-in-law. Um, good on him and all, but I imagine how awkward this could be. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine them being like Captain Hook and Prince Charming from Once Upon a Time. And their age similarity definitely did not make their interactions any easier. And at the end, we are all told that everyone in the story lived way longer than humanly possible. Except Beauty's adoptive mother, of course, she is still dead. But her real parents lived for centuries, and it's obviously nice. But did this long life extend it to all their descendants? And how much? Were their children the only ones allowed to live a prolonged life and, as such, had to see their own children die? Or did every generation have this possibility? I... I need answers. You can't just leave me hanging like that. Anyway, final thoughts. This book sucks. Beauty is a glorified Mary Sue. Everyone praises her like she's a second Jesus, but we never actually see her doing anything praiseworthy. She is constantly revered for having fallen in love with the beast, despite his ugly nature, but that's not true. She fell in love with a handsome prince that she saw in her dreams, not with an ugly monster that she met in real life. At the very least, we know that their marriage dynamics will not change because she married exactly the man she wanted to. Speaking of our were Dumbo, he needs therapy. ASAP. We are meant to believe that he lived happily ever after a beauty, but what we are not told is the amount of times his very relatives had to magically prevent his cuckoo from crawling into the sunset. Because the man has so many issues, an entire mob of psychologists could defend their PhD with him. The supporting characters are all horrible, except for maybe Beauty's brothers, but they don't really have a line of dialogue and only third-person narration, so maybe that's why. Also, Beauty's real dad, but he's the last character to be introduced. There probably was not enough time to ruin him. The magic in this story is also all over the place. I don't expect 18th century book to build a cohesive magic system that's expected of the books today. But the thing is, in the first part we have very little magical elements. There were some hints, like the castle itself with its rooms seemingly changing positions and, you know, food appearing quite probably out of nowhere. But at the same time, the magical animals are very realistic. Parrots can, in fact, imitate human speech, and monkeys are smart enough to do some basic tasks. And the theatre and the opera that Beauty went to were actual things in France and Italy, and she was seeing the performance through some arrangements of mirrors. Which sounds really... stupid. I mean, can you imagine a system of mirrors going through countries into the beast's castle and no one noticing that? But overall, it felt like the nerf was trying to convince its readers that there is no real magic, only science, which is characteristic of many New Age writers. But then we reach the second part and the book goes all bonkers on the magical stuff. We get fairies and magical worlds with ancient rules. There's teleportation and shape-shifting and terrible curses. It's so inconsistent and it comes out of nowhere. It feels almost like these two parts were written by two different people. Or at the very least that Villeneuve wrote the first part and the second part was only an afterthought, written after a significant amount of time has already passed and Villeneuve didn't really remember what she had written and didn't really feel like refreshing her memory. I don't know, these two don't really add up. Though, I have to say, I like how there are a lot of answers to the questions we usually get in more modern interpretations of the story. I believe this happens because newer versions are based on Beaumont's version of the story, 
which was greatly simplified and lacked almost the entire backstory, which is legitimately the best part of the book. So, to conclude, if you still want to read the book, maybe you are doing some research for fan fiction, fan art, role play, I don't know, then skip the first part. I'm not lying when I say that there is absolutely nothing happening in it. It's just beauty watching the theatre, simping for her dream babe and hating on the beast. Seriously, don't even bother. Go straight to the second part. At least things happen there. These things may mess you up, but they are there. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe. Baka baka.